Big Red, Part 4. There was a rustling ahead in a little patch of ferns, and Red sprang joyously forward to dive into them. Ross broke into a little trot, and when Danny came up beside him, he was looking at the brown entrance of a burrow in the center of the ferns. Red was digging with his front paws in the mouth of the burrow, and a little geyser of dirt spouted out on either side. Ross said scornfully, Your New York dog's trying to dig himself out of woodchuck now, Danny. Talk to him. Tell him real gentle-like what a naughty boy he is. <laughs> oh, my. Chapter 5, Red's Education. Danny shifted his feet uncomfortably and looked from the growing pile of dirt behind Red to Ross. The big setter, shoulder deep in the hole, came to a turn and swerved to dig in this new direction. Danny reached down to twine his fingers in Red's collar and drew him out of the hole. Come out of there, he said as roughly as he could. The big dog stood panting as he gazed eagerly back down the hole. He made a little lunge as though to get back in, and Danny took a firmer grasp on his collar. Red bent his head, snuffling at the hot scent of the woodchug in the hole. He whined eagerly. Ross's frozen face melted. Don't look so miserable about it, he said. All the dog needs is some more teaching. Any tenderfoot dog worth its salt is going to chase any kind of varmint. But what a varmint dog this will make. Danny gulped wretchedly. What should I ought to do about it, Pappy? I'd give him a hiding, Ross suggested seriously. Now, if he was a, had a coon up a tree, I'd say let him go to it for all he's worth. But a varmint dog can't stay at dens and dig into every one he runs over. It takes too much time. He's got to have a mind to stop it. But you can't give Red a licking, Danny said desperately. He's too smart and sensitive. Given I licked him, he, he'd have no trust in me anymore. Do tell, Ross scoffed. The dog was never born as didn't need to have some sense licked into him at least once. But as I said before, it's your dog. Bring him along and we'll get on with our fishing. Danny tugged on Red's collar and the big setter strained backward toward the woodchuck hole. Danny dragged him from it with Red protesting every step of the way. And when they had gone a hundred feet further, set him free. Red mounted an anthill and waved his plumed tail gently as he stared back toward the enticing den. Then he bounded to a moss-covered stump and smelled eagerly at it. Danny watched worriedly. A partridge dog had always to work within the range of the hunter with him, and of course he must learn that partridges were the only game he could hunt. A dog to chase off after everything that crossed its path would be worse than useless. But how to break him of his penchant for chasing varmints? Ross scoffed at the notion that a whipping would hurt him, but Danny knew better. Red had depths of feeling and sensitivity that he had seen in no other dog, and he was proud. He wouldn't bear the lash any more than would a proud man. Danny looked worriedly at Ross's back. Taking care of a highly bred dog brought perplexing problems. A small buck with ragged shreds of velvet clinging to his nearly matured antlers stepped from behind a beech tree and stood looking at them. Ross halted. The wind shifted, carried to the buck the scent of human beings, and with a rasping snort and a mighty leap, he hoisted his white tail over his back and bounded away. Ross lifted the fishing rod he carried, and with the imaginary gun followed the buck's course. He turned to grin. I could have had him. I could have had him three, four times while he tore through the trees that away. Reckon you could, Pappy, Danny agreed. He'd seen Ross bring down a buck running through slashings and a hundred yards away. But he was studying Red and heaved a great sigh of relief when the big setter betrayed no more than a passing interest in the buck. Deer scent, he knew, was the most pungent and exciting of any scent. Probably the hardest part of training any dog was to teach it not to run deer. And a dog that would run them was almost incurable. 
Danny had known of deer running hounds to follow eagerly a scent two days old. But most hounds took naturally to running deer and most settlers would do so only if their interest in deer was deliberately encouraged. 200 yards further on, they flushed a doe and her adolescent fawn and Red merely looked at them. He fell in beside Danny and Danny reached gratefully down to stroke his ear. They came to a sunlit meadow with a tangle of blackberry briars at one end and lush wild hay carpeting the remainder. Smoky Creek brushed the far side of the meadow and broadened into a long pool deep at the upper end and shallow at the lower. The shiners Ross wanted swarmed in the pool and there were a few big bass there Trout occasionally came into the pool, but preferred the more secluded and shadier portions of the creek. Red left Danny's side and darted swiftly forward. He paused to look back, then advanced another ten feet. Ross stopped perplexedly, studying the dog as he lifted one forefoot and held his tail stiffly behind him. Danny exulted, and some of the anxiety that had sat so heavily upon him since he had discovered Red's bent for chasing varmints departed. He knew these signs. Red was on a partridge now, and if he was somewhat clumsy about it, he still was not doing badly for a dog that had had no training. Danny laid the rod and can of bait he carried on the ground and stooped to pick up a stone. He walked quietly forward, grasped Red's collar, and cast the tone stone into a small patch of blackberries at which he was pointing. A partridge thundered up and soared across the meadow into the beech woods. Red whined and twisted under Danny's restraining hand as he strove to follow. He reared with his front feet, pawing the air. Danny held him. Easy, he murmured. Don't get excited. The big setter dropped back to earth and stood watching the place where the partridge had disappeared. As soon as Danny let him go, he raced out to cast around in circles and look for another bird. Danny watched him leaping high in the tall grass so he could both see and scent and turned to Ross with shining eyes. He had a partridge that time, he said. I see he did, Ross. Ross looked disapprovingly at the ranging dog. That's bad, Danny. A varmint dog shouldn't hunt nothing but varmints. He should have oughtn't to go chasing off after birds. Danny said nothing. Red came bounding back and splashed shoulder deep in the pool to lap thirstily at its crystal clear water. He lay down to cool himself. A school of suckers moved sluggishly away from him and a half a dozen shiners darted erratically toward the bank where they fell to nosing about the flat rocks that dotted the pool's bottom. Ross strung up his rod, baited the hook and cast Almost as soon as the line settled into the water, a gentle tugging told of a bite. Ross struck and his four ounce rod curved slightly as he played a shiner into the bank and slipped it into the live bag that he had tied to a willow root beside the pool. Red splashed out of the pool and stretched in the sun at Danny's feet and went to sleep. Danny strung his own rod, cast, and almost immediately caught a fat chub. He put it in a live bag and rebaited his hook and caught another. So there's the partridge exploding out of the briar, huh? <laughs> there was no sport in catching chubs and shiner, but fish was the basis of almost every scent that he and Ross used on their far-flung trap lines when winter came. And they took a major portion of their livelihood from trapping. For two hours they fished until the live bag was swarming with shiners. Then, instead of the gentle tug that told of a shiner nibbling, Danny's line st darted straight across the pool. He let it go, feeling through the line the wand-like rod that a big fish was on this time. The line stopped moving and Danny waited tensely with two feet of slack looping from the reel. You better draw your line in, warned Ross. I got a bass out there fiddling with my bait, and he feels like a big one. Given I catch him, we won't eat side meat for supper. Again, the line began to move, and Danny struck hard. Out in the black pool where the taut line dipped into the water, there was a swirling little ripple. Far out, a gleaming 
bronze black baths broke water and splashed back in as he strove to shake the hook. He bore down toward the bottom, and Danny paid out more line as he let him go. The rod, one that Ross himself had made, bent almost double. Danny elevated the tip to let the fish tire himself against the spring and stripped in 10 feet of line as the bass surged toward the bank. Red rose and stood watching. Hang on, Ross yelled. He's a nice one. I'm a trying to, Danny panted. The bass turned back into the pool and Danny paid out the line that he had retrieved. Again, the fish broke water, rising high above the surface and falling back into it. He began to run in little circles that grew shorter as he became more tired and Danny played him toward the bank. Slowly, he fought the bass into the shallows and Ross waded out to stand knee deep in the water. He ran his fingers down Danny's taut line, fastened them to the bass's gills, and lifted him triumphantly free of the pool. Four pounds, he gloated. Danny, I disremember any such bass taken from Smoky Creek before. He sure is pretty, Danny agreed. And he'll go plenty good for supper, huh? You bet, Ross agreed. Let's say we catch a half a dozen more shiners and go home. It's nigh on to evening time. They fished 10 minutes, added six more to the bag of shiners, and dismounted their rods. The sun was sinking in the west, and a golden aureola glowed on the summits of the tallest mountains. Far back in the forest, a fox yelled, and the wan, sad cry of a morning dove came from the nearby beaches. But aside from that, the forest was strangely hushed. Red ranged ahead of them as they walked homeward, sniffing at likely cracks and crevices whenever he found them. And when he passed the woodchuck hole, he sniffed long and deeply at it. But few of the wilderness creatures were moving. They came to the fence and Danny lifted it to let Red crawl under. Ross climbed over and Danny was about to do so when a rabbit burst from a bunch of thistle and went bounding across the pasture. With a wild yell, Red was after it. The rabbit lengthened out, his white tail twinkling as he called on every bit of speed he possessed. Red flew, his tail close to the ground and head up as he strove to overtake this enticing quarry. Chained to their kennels, the four hounds bayed loud encouragement. Ooh, 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 ooh. Even Ace of the Mule overcame his customary indifference to everything sufficiently to raise his head and watch. Danny yelled, Red, come back here, come back. The big setter paid no heed, but bounded on after the fleeing rabbit. A half a jump ahead of the dog, it flashed beneath a rock pile and disappeared. With his hindquarters in the air and his front ones close to the ground, Red pawed futilely at the rocks. Danny ran up, grasped his collar, and jerked him roughly aside. You red, I don't know what I will do with you anyhow. Ross walked up. Gall ding it. I said I wouldn't meddle in the way you teach your dog, but he sure needs a hiding. You let him sniff into dens and holes that away, and he ain't never going to be no good for nothing. Pappy, I won't whip that dog. Ross shrugged. Red looked happily up tongue lolling, tail wagging, and a bright devilish gleam in his eye. Danny's heart melted. Red was smart, with all the heart and courage that anyone could ask for or expect to find in a dog. There must be some method other than whipping to wean him away from this sort of chasing and make him hunt partridges only. Danny gritted his teeth. It was up to him to find the method. He pulled Red into the house. Ross took their catch of shiners into the shed and began to prepare the trap line scents that only he could make properly. Red went out to lie down on the porch. Danny skinned the bass, split it, and removed the heavy spinal bone. He laid the two halves in a pan of cold water and added a little salt. Red pushed the door open with his nose and came back in. Danny looked fondly at him. Rabbit chaser, he murmured. Darn old rabbit chaser. 
When you gonna get some sense into you? Red thumped the floor with his tail, while Danny took the two halves of the bass and laid them in a hot skillet. He sliced potatoes in another skillet and put them on the stove to fry while he set the table. His hands covered with fish scales, Ross entered and washed. He took his homemade violin from its case, drew the bow across it a couple of times, and sat on a chair to coax from it the haunting strains of Johnny O'Dare. Danny sang softly with him. Johnny O'Dare, the moon is a-glowin', the silver clouds in the sky are a-showin', and I sit alone, but alone am knowin'. You'll come home to me, Johnny O'Dare. He grinned, the day was gone, and with it, all the doubts and perplexities it had brought. He and Ross and Red were alone, with plenty to eat and a song in their heart. It was enough. Danny put the cooked food on the table and Ross returned the violin to its case. Both sat down to eat. What are we gonna do tomorrow, Pappy? Danny asked. Mr. Hagen asked me to fetch him 24 quarts of blackberries, Ross said. I better get at that come morning. He'll pay 15 cents a quart. After that, I won't be able to take any side jobs on a counter. There's trap lines that ain't staked out and I feel an ache for a varmint hunt. How would you like to chop down and trim a few trees for wood? Sure, fine. Ross took a great forkful of the bass. This is mighty tasty fish, Danny. By the way, do you consider that we should ought to let the red dog run along when I take the hounds on a varmint hunt? Old Mike will teach him some tricks, and he's smart enough to pick up where Mike leaves off. Danny choked on the food in his mouth. I, I... I just don't favor the notion of Red's running with the hounds. Ross looked at him a little resentfully. Well, it's your dog. Danny went out to sit on the porch, while Red sat beside him and poked his nose into Danny's cupped hand. This was mighty serious. Ross had his heart set on making Red a varmint dog, and Red just couldn't be a varmint dog. It was in him to hunt birds, nothing else. Danny's right arm stole out to encircle the big setter's neck. You gotta be a bird dog, he said. You chase them little varmints because it's fun, but at heart, you're a bird hunter. I sure wish Pappy'd understand. How are we gonna make him? Ross was already in bed when Danny re-entered the cottage and sought his own cot. And though Danny was up with the sun, Ross had risen, prepared his own breakfast, taken his picking pails and departed for the blackberry thicket. Danny milked the cow, fed Asa and Red, ate a great heap of pancakes, and took a razor-keen, double-bitted axe from its rack in the closet. He went outside, strung Asa's leather and chain harness on the bony old mule, and hooked a long chain into the single tree that dragged behind. Asa followed indifferently when Danny started toward a stand of yellow birch that had grown up in the beaches. Mr. Hagen, who owned most of the beech woods, as well as the great Wintappy estate, didn't want any other trees cut as long as there was scrap wood like yellow birch around. Red ranged before them, sniffing at likely thickets and bits of brush along the way. He came to a stiff point beside a clump of laurel and held it while Danny flushed two partridges. Red made an eager little jump forward and stopped. Danny forgot to breathe. The dog was smart, plenty smart, and getting the idea that it was not right to chase the partridge as he pointed. Danny frowned. If only he could get the same idea about varmints. But how to teach him without resorting to violent methods? I think you're doing it out of devilishness alone, Danny murmured, more to himself than to the dog. Dog on it, Red, why can't you stop? A hundred feet further on, Red, had an ecstatic time chasing a chipmunk that was rooting in the falling leaves of a beech nut. And a little beyond, he tore through the woods after a fleeing rabbit. Danny swung his ax and lopped down the thick weeds that were growing up beside the trail, shouting at Red, as he had proven yesterday, did no good. Maybe after all, he would have to use the choke collar and drag rope. He came to the stand of yellow birch and hitched Asa to one and set to work felling the slender little trees. Most of the day he worked, chopping the birches down, trimming the branches from them, piling them in a great heap. 
In the middle of the afternoon, he untied Asa, led him to the felled trees, hooked the chain around a dozen of them, and tightened it. He led the mule back down the trail, left the trees in the chip-littered wood yard behind the shanty, and went back for another load. Dusk had fallen when he went down the trail with the last of the trees, and blue smoke was rising lazily from the cabin's chimney. He led Asa to the wood yard and was piling the trees on those already there when Ross came from the cabin to stand silently watching. You got a right smart load of wood, he finally observed. You better give Asa a feed of grain and rub, rub him down too. I'll have some vittles for you when you come in. Danny cared for the mule, hung the harness in the barn and with red padding beside him, entered the house. Ross bent over the stove and when Danny came in, he turned to smile wanly. I bet you got a yen for grub, he said. I could eat, Danny admitted, but I'm not so tired. Tell me about yourself. Did you see Mr. Hagen? Yep. With studied deliberation, Ross turned away from him and faced the stove. I took him his berries. By the way, Danny, he wants you should bring the red dog and come down in the morning. There's some sort of quality woman staying there, and I guess he wants she should see him. Why, sure. It's Mr. Hagen's dog. He's got the right to see him if he wants. Danny, what? I sat down and eat your supper. Ross finished lamely. You won't have nothing else to do tomorrow. I'll take care of the wood you and Asa brought in. The two of us with a crosscut will get it sawed quicker, Danny said. What's the matter with you, Pappy? Nothing. Set and eat. Danny ate and after eating strolled through the evening woods with red while wa Ross washed the dishes. He was a little worried about his father. That Ross should even offer to wash the dishes was astounding in itself. Still, there didn't seem to be any physical difficulty. Evidently, Ross had something on his mind. When darkness fell, Danny went into bed. He was up very early and scrubbed his face to the point of immaculateness in the tin basin. He put on a clean shirt and a fresh pair of trousers, and after breakfast, with Red frisking beside him, started down the Smoky Creek Trail. A red fox leaped across the trail ahead of him, and Red dashed wildly to lunge at it. After ten minutes, Red came back, panting heavily. Danny frowned and walked on. They broke out of the woods, into the rolling acres of Mr. Hagen's estate, and started across them. Red fell back to pace sedately at Danny's side, and Danny reached down to reassure himself by touching the dog's head. Of course, Mr. Hagen was a mighty fine man, but just the same, it was hard not to feel at least a little awed when approaching such magnificence as was to be encountered in his Wintappy estate. Danny saw two riders galloping on a pair of Mr. Hagen's blooded horses along a bridle trail and looked carefully at them. One was Mr. Hagen himself, and the other looked like a woman. Danny stopped in front of the barn. By the way, a blooded horse, I, I assume that means a thoroughbred. A full-blooded full thoroughbred. The two riders galloped in, and Red backed uncertainly against his knees. A groom came forward to take their horses, and Mr. Hagen and his companion swung from their saddles to come toward Danny. Mr. Hagen's booming voice, voice bridged the distance between them. Good morning, Danny. Morning, sir. I brought Red down. Danny was studying the woman. She was tall, slender, and moved with the easy grace of a sable. She was dressed in riding breeches, polished boots, and a silken shirt. Her black hair had blown back on her head, and her cheeks were flushed. Certainly it was the quality woman of whom Ross had spoken. Yet Danny twitched uncomfortably. There was something very hard and very cold about her, as though she had always had her own way and always intended to have it. Miss Grinnan, meet Danny Pickett, Mr. Hagen said. So if she moved like a sable, she must have, uh, must have like very elegant and flowing, and uh, maybe like a ballet dancer, moved like a fox, like a cat. <laughs>
Hello, Danny, the quality woman smiled. Howdy, ma'am, Danny mumbled. Miss Grennans, the manager of my Philadelphia branch, Mr. Hagen explained. There's the dog I was telling you about, Catherine. Champion Sylvester's boy. Oh, Dick, what a gorgeous creature. The quality woman knelt beside Red and put her hand on his ruff. Red backed a little nearer to Danny to get away from the smell of the perfume she wore. Danny looked at her with miserable eyes, knowing now why Ross had been so perturbed last night. The quality woman rose to her feet. Dick, give him to me. Whoa there, wait a minute. What would you do with a dog like that? Dick, let me have him. Mr. Hagen coughed <coughs> and looked away. He squirmed and coughed again. <coughs> now, Catherine, your sense of acquisitiveness, acquisitiveness, I think it's uh, a form of the word acquisition. She's trying to acquire the dog. Oh, you silly. Let me have him for six months and show him off in Philly. I can't let you have that dog. Why not, Danny? Catherine grinned and smiled again. What do you say, Danny? Well, I sure wouldn't like to see Red leave here. The quality woman was very cold now and very hard. I know you wouldn't, Danny, but it isn't your dog, is it? It belongs to Mr. Hagen, doesn't it? Danny said manfully, yes, ma'am. There, she said triumphantly. Now let me have him, Dick. Mr. Hagen looked at Danny. Do you think she should take him? It's your dog, Danny said. There, old Iron Man, the quality woman said. You can't have another thing to say. Anyhow, he'll be back in six months. Mr. Hagen shrugged helplessly. Danny, do you want to leave him now or bring him in the morning? Well, Danny hedged. I could just as leave, bring him in the morning and save you the bother of feeding him tonight. Do that, Danny, the quality woman smiled. I'll be leaving at eight o'clock. With Red beside him, Danny turned miserably away. He swung from the trail to the foot of Misty Mountain and started up its slope. When Red dashed after a squirrel, Danny only looked dully at him. The big dog might as well have his fun. Tomorrow morning, he was going to Philadelphia. And that was almost as big as New York. There'd be no forest there, nothing except pavement and little patches of green grass that were called parks. With the back of his hand, Danny wiped the tears from his eyes. The quality woman didn't really want a dog or know what a fine dog was. She wanted Red because he looked nice and would compliment her own faultless groomed self. Every morning, probably, she would take him walking on a leash, and the rest of the time, he'd spend chained to some little kennel where there was just enough grass for him to scratch in. It wasn't right to take a dog like Red away from the life he was meant for. The bushes moved, and Red dashed happily in to chase whatever small creature was moving them. A little further on, he pointed two grouse, and Danny didn't even try to keep him from running after them when they flushed. All day he walked up Misty Mountain, down its other side, and into the nameless gullies and ravines that lay beyond. It was his last day with Red. True, the quality woman had said that she would bring him back in six months, but Danny didn't believe it. Once she got him, she'd find some excuse for keeping him. Darkness had fallen when Danny swung back to the clearing in the beech woods and stamped wearily into the cabin. Ross was there, sitting at the table, staring at the flickering kerosene lamp. He turned blankly around. Quality woman down to Mr. Hagen's, Danny explained dully. Mr. Hagen gave red to her. She's taking him come eight o'clock in the morning. I got to fetch him down then. Ross nodded. I figured she'd try to get her hooks in him, given she saw him. I pegged her for that kind. What are you going to do about it, Danny? Take him down, Danny said hopelessly. It's Mr. Hagen's rightful dog. He sat miserably on a chair 
and pecked at the food that Ross put before him and pillowed his chin in his hands. Ross filled and smoked a pipe, something he did only in times of great stress, and there was a long silence. You know what, Danny, he said finally, if I had the money cost of that dog, I'd buy him and give him to you. We haven't got $7,000, Danny said bitterly. We haven't got $70. That's right, Ross said tiredly. Danny rose and sawed his cot, praying for sleep that would not come. Sleep brought forgetfulness, and if he could forget for only a few minutes. But the long night hours dragged dismally and endlessly on. Just before dawn, he fell into a restless and dream-troubled slumber from which Ross awakened him. Danny, I don't want to bother you, but if you have to be down to Mr. Higgins at 8 o'clock, it's nearly quarter past 7. Sure, sure. Thanks for waking me, Pappy. Danny got out of bed, and Red padded eagerly in to greet him with lolling tongue and wagging tail. Danny tore his eyes away from the big setter and put on clean clothes he had worn yesterday. There must be no fumbling or faltering now, unless the quality woman wanted to walk into the country back of Stony Lonesome to claim her dog. Danny stooped to pat Red's forehand and with an effort walked past him to linger in front of the door. I, I'll have some biddles when I get back, Pappy, he said. Likely it won't take me long. Sure. Ross turned around to stare out the window. Danny opened the door and Red raced happily out. He dashed at a rabbit that was nibbling clover at the edge of the pasture and ran it under the stone pile. After scratching at the unyielding stones a few seconds, he ran down the trail to catch up with Danny. Danny walked stolidly forward, turning his head away from the dog. A powerful magnet seemed to be pulling him toward Stony Lonesome, where he could take Red and where Mr. Hagen and the quality woman couldn't find him if he didn't want to be found. But that wouldn't be right. Red was Mr. Hagen's dog. Some tall grass beside the trail moved and Red raced joyously down to investigate. He jumped in the grass, remained a moment, and came stumbling out. For a bit, he stood in the trail and rubbed his face in its graveled bottom. Danny said sternly, Heel! He marched steadily on, not looking around. Red had had his last run after a varmint. When he got to Philadelphia, there might be a cat or two for him to chase. But certainly, there would be nothing more. Danny took a deep breath and plunged out of the forest onto Mr. Hagen's estate. He saw Mr. Hagen standing with one foot on the running board of a smart roadster and the quality woman in it with her hands on the wheel. She looked curiously around as Mr. Hagen said, Good morning, Danny. Morning, sir. The quality woman took a silk handkerchief from her purse and held it delicately against her nose. Red backed against Danny's knees, and Danny steeled his aching heart. The big setter did not want to go, but he must go. Danny stooped, put his arm around Red's chest and the other around his rear legs. He lifted him bold bodily and deposited him on the polished leather seat beside the quality woman. Here's your dog, ma'am, he murmured. Suddenly and violently, the quality woman recoiled. She grimaced, grabbed the silk handkerchief with both hands, plastered it against her nose. Get that thing out of here, she gasped. Red hopped over the side of the car and squeezed very close to Danny's legs. The woman turned furious eyes on Mr. Higgins, whose face had turned purple and whose mouth was emitting subdued gurgles. Dick, if this is your idea of a joke... Now, Catherine, I swear I had nothing whatever to do with it. The quality woman put her car in gear, stepped on the gas, and gravel spurted from beneath the wheels as she roared toward the road. Mr. Hagen gasped and burst into gales of uncontrolled laughter. <laughs> Danny watched wonderingly. Oh, Lord, Mr. Hagen said at last. That's the best I ever saw. Catherine thought she knew everything and found out that she still has something to learn. Take your dog and go back up into the beech woods, Danny. He's safe now. <laughs>
Danny had already gone, was racing up the Smoky Creek Trail on winged feet with Red gambling happily beside him. A small rabbit hap hopped across the trail and Red made a wide circle around it. Danny burst into the cabin. Pappy, he yelled. Pappy, I got Red back and I'm going to keep him. He don't chase varmints no more either. He wouldn't run at a little old rabbit in the trail. That quality woman, she's gone and she won't want him just because on the way down he jumped on a skunk. Can you imagine anybody not wanting a dog like him just because he smells? Ross's eyes were shining, but he shook his head gravely. City women are funny that way, he observed. I'm so glad for you, Danny, but you better take your dog down to the creek and wash him off. He do smell a bit, and in a couple of weeks, you won't hardly notice it at all. <laughs> Chapter 6, The Leaves Rustle the summer days faded like golden shadows one into another, and the first frost came to leaves, its delicate traceries on the earth and a riot of colors behind it. Danny went into the deep woods with Ross, packing loads of traps and caching them in hollow stumps and caverns where all traces of man scent would be eliminated. He climbed mountains and traveled streams, blazing with his axe every place where a set trap might make a fur-bearing animal and getting ready for the long winter to come. But when he was not doing that, he was abroad with red.